So, hello and good evening. We are back from our break and this is, as you might have already guessed, the live stream of the University Paderborn, the, uh, yeah, it's in German here, but it should have been in English, uh, the study service uh, at the University of Paderborn, or at Paderborn University, I should correctly say. And what we're doing here is, of course, as usual, our program, uh, special information about our master program. We, are doing the, we do these live streams uh, basically every month at 6 p.m. on the third Thursday each month. There's also another live stream if somebody's out there right now who's more interested in the bachelor, in the bachelor program of our university, of our Compu Department of Computer Science, uh, then uh, the first Thursday each month is, might be the date that you might want to mark in, in your calendar. Uh, because on the third, sorry, on the first Thursday each month, we are talking about the bachelor program, and that is in German, of course. Uh, and on the third Thursday each month, month, like it is today, we're talking about the master program, and this is in English because our master program is right now basically in English, and from October onwards is purely in English. So uh, this is why we're doing this in this language. Um, as I said, we, oh, we always do this at 6 p.m. Uh, 6 p.m. means, uh, depending on where in the world you are, might mean different uh, times for you because uh, we are currently at, uh, in, in the summer time, so um, we've shifted our time from the normal uh, time, uh, Central European time, to Central European summer time. Uh, so we are in summer time, although it doesn't feel like that, it's just... 11 degrees out there, so it's not really summer temperatures, but anyways, we have uh, summertime, and uh, that's why we are here uh, tonight and at, at this time. And um, yeah, so if you want to tune in in the coming months until October, we will stick in, we'll stay in, in summertime. Um, what is also important is uh, that uh, we don't have these uh, uh, live streams in March and in September. So this is why last month we weren't here. And this is why I at the beginning said, welcome back. Or we are back uh, because uh, we took a little break, to some, some time off. Uh, because uh, we wanted to do a couple of different things as well uh, sometime in between. So that's why we are here. Uh, only now in, in April. Our semester has just started, so um, we are uh, back in uh, normal lecturing schedule, so to speak. So we, uh, we, we started, um, I'm just a little irritated because something should be here. Ah, that's my mistake. All right. Sorry, a little technical glitch here, uh, which is my fault, not the technical system's fault. Um, so, um, yeah, as I said, we, the semester has just started, so everything is fresh and new for the students who have just started here. If someone out there is listening right now or uh, joining or, or listening into this uh, live stream after the fact, so it's recorded and it will be available on, on the website, uh, on, the, on the YouTube channel, of course. Uh, so if uh, somebody is out there who has just started now in, in April and uh, has not taken part in the, in the welcome days that we did in the first week of April, uh, please contact us at the study service and uh, then we can uh, bring you up to speed what, uh, about everything uh, you need to know about studying in Paderborn, studying computer science in Paderborn, uh, picking your courses, uh, registering for courses for Studienleistung and so on and so forth. Uh, we already have a question there and we'll talk about that in a moment. So. Um, uh, it's very important so that if you missed uh, the, these welcome days, please contact us. Uh, our contact address is below this video. There's lots of links uh, given there. First one is to the study service, uh, which is our, our website, and there you'll find the contact information. And there's lots of other links uh, to lots of different information uh, that you can always visit, of course. So uh, that's the one thing I wanted to uh, mention at the beginning and um, what we are going to talk about now is um, the first thing uh, depend, depends very much it's uh, this is an interactive thing so uh, if you are sitting out there and think you you might have some questions whether you are already studying here with us or whether you are thinking about applying or uh, you have applied and have already gotten an um, a positive answer from us so that your application has been accepted. Um, so when, whatever kinds of questions you have, please are, feel free to ask them and I'll try and answer them as good as I can. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll always have a little drink in between. So, so cheers. Uh, it's alcohol free, of course, so that I keep my concentration. Uh, but I need something for, for my, my voice. So cheers. Okay. 
All right. So um, yeah, just uh, let's let's get into uh, the the question. Uh, there's one question already uh, pending here, of, uh, as you might see in the there or over there. I don't never know where it is. Somewhere over there. Um, and uh, after that, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the, 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 uh, some important uh, deadlines that are uh, upcoming. And uh, then after that, unless there are questions, of course, which I can address, um, if there's no questions, uh, then I would uh, continue uh, talking about a little bit about the new master program, for our, uh, so that might be interesting for our current students. And after that, um, i just keep that brief, but we can talk about that a little bit, because things will change in October. There's not too much change. There's a couple of changes in the bachelor program, but as I said, we're concentrating on the master program here, and the changes in the master program are very minor. And apart from that, I uh, would also like to talk about uh, the application process and what you need to consider when applying to our university, to our, the computer science program in our university, uh, because application phase is running right now. We are, have already received around more than 150 applications for the next winter semester. And uh, we are expecting lots more, and this there might be uh, uh, lots of uh, in, uh, useful information for you if you plan to apply. Uh, applications are possible until until third, uh, sorry, thirty first of May, so still some six weeks or so left. Uh, you can apply now for the next winter semester, and you can apply year-round anyway. Uh, it only depends on when you apply, which is the next semester you can apply for. So you can even apply now for not for the you can apply now for the winter semester. You can do so until the 31st of May, but you can also apply now already for the next for the upcoming summer semester, which would start it, excuse me, next year in April. And, uh, of course, after 31st of May, the only chance you have is applying for the upcoming summer semester or even a semester further up in the future. Okay, so we'll talk about those things, but uh, let's start with the first question uh, that has come in here. Uh, hi, Eric. Building stuff, that's a good idea always, building stuff. Um, you would like to know about the rules for unregistering a course and its module after failing Studienleistung. If the course is offered again, is passing the Studienleistung for the same course possible? Uh, yes, of course. You can do the Studienleistung as often as you like. So there's no risk in taking uh, or, or in failing the Studienleistung. There's no absolutely no consequences at all. Uh, you start just start afresh. You don't have to register again for the Studienleistung. So probably, if you can, always check with Paul. If there's anything you can, if there's, if there's anything in a course, let's like, like, suppose you have picked a certain course and uh, there is something like a Studienleistung in there and you can uh, register for it, then do it. Uh, because if in doubt, always always click register because you can deregister later if you if you like to. Uh, deregistering is always, uh, unregistering is always easier uh, because there's other deadlines for that that are way in the future. So uh, in, in general, it's a good idea to, to register. If, if there's anything you can um, register for, do it. Uh, by that, I don't mean register for all modules, but uh, if, you are in a, if you have decided to take a course and there is something you can register for in that course, then you should register for that. Um, so that uh, would, be, would be a good idea. Um, so, as I said, you can, uh, if, if you fail the Studienleistung, it's, it's absolutely no, con it's just as if you never took the course at all, uh, it's no, no difference, so uh, you can start afresh and uh, there's no consequences. So, as I said, with exam it's different, uh, if, as you probably know, exams, you can take exams up to three times, and if you fail an exam three times, then that course is ultimately failed, and you can't take that course anymore. You can take other courses instead, so not, your, pro your studies are not fin or not ended by uh, failing one module completely. You need to fail several modules. Right now, it's, uh, you need to fail at least four modules uh, to, to completely drop out of the course with some special regulations concerning seminars and project groups and, and the master's thesis, of course. But the normal modules, you can fail uh, four modules uh, up to three times each uh, before you are, uh, uh, have, have uh, completed, uh, you're, you've completely failed uh, the, the computer science master program. And in the future, that will be even much, much harder because then you there will be more compensation possibilities in the future. So it will be virtually impossible to uh, get thrown out of the program because you failed too many modules. Um, this is also very hard to do now, uh, so you, you, uh, I don't think we ever had anyone failing because of that. 
people might have failed in, for, for other reasons, but not for the reason of not com uh, being able to complete any more modules or something like that. Um, and uh, apart from that, you usually can deregister or unregister from a course uh, bef only until the Studienleistung is entered into the system, but there are some exceptions, and for those exceptions, it's best to contact the examination office because there's certain possibilities to deregister modules even later on. There's, an, uh, there's a maximum number of modules that you can deregister from, and there's some, some special regulations. So I would con uh, recommend in this case, if you want to register from a course, because you don't want to take it anymore, uh, you should only do that if you are sure that you don't want ever uh, don't ever want to complete that course anymore. Uh, and in that case, uh, I would uh, only in that case I would uh, recommend uh, unre de unregistering or deregistering from that course. Uh, and um, yeah, basically, that's that's the idea. And apart from that, you you can simply stick with the course and as long as, as it doesn't hurt you and it doesn't block any other uh, block you from. Uh, choosing other other modules, for example, that would be the only other reason why you might want to deregister from a course completely. Apart from that, if you consider taking the course again in the next year, in the next semester, in the next year, sometimes uh, in the future, uh, then you should simply leave it open, and um, it's, it does no harm uh, because it, it's just lying around there and doesn't do anything. Right. Okay. So uh, this is the first question about. Um, about unregistering. If there's further questions, just keep uh, keep them coming, uh, and I'll try to clarify if there's anything uh, that uh, ha has been unclear in my explanations right now. Okay, so uh, next question up here. Uh, you, hello, Muhammad, Muhammad, sorry. Uh, you wish to apply for the Master in Computer Science as an international student. That's great. Uh, bachelor's degree will complete in May 24. Good one. Uh, you'll get the original certificate a bit, yes, uh, probably it's, it will be uh, a bit late. Um, this is what you write, uh, got the original certificate, degree certificate uh, a little, a, a, little a bit late. And the question now, of course, is whether it is possible for you to apply. Yes, it is, in fact. Um, we will, in that case, uh, we'll talk about the exact process. Links are below uh, for if you want to read it and if you don't want to stick around for, until I coming to it by explaining it in this video. But apart from that, I would recommend stay, sticking with, with me or, or watching this video later on if you can't stick uh, with us uh, for, for right now, uh, because I will explain the, the process in a little detail at least. Um, and maybe you already know that uh, you need to send all of your documents to UniAssist, which is a, a, an external um, company uh, which uh, or entity which uh, runs the complete uh, application process so you'll have to send all of your documents to them and uh, then they will uh, they will rate you, uh, they will they will um, prepare all the documents for us and then they'll send uh, they'll forward those documents to us so you never need to send any documents directly to us and um, in those documents uh, they uh, tell us exactly uh, what the uh, what the your your state of affairs so to speak is um, and there we will see. Uh, yeah, he's he's on a good track uh, basically. So they take your CGPA until that moment, uh, which will will then be displayed to us as your not not final grade, but as your the best approximation to what your final grade might be like. And um, we then uh, evaluate everything based on. Um, on, on the documents that you sent until that moment. And we are aware of the fact that maybe you are still only in the seventh semester and you still haven't completed all of your courses. So uh, in that case, what we will do, we, we will put you kind of on, on hold. Uh, so uh, we'll not accept or reject your application, but we'll put you on hold and you'll get a notification as well uh, that we still are, we, 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 we need the, the, the final degree, but that can be handed in later. So even if by 31st of March you only send the documents you have available until then, then we can only evaluate the documents that you have already sent, obviously. And then we will um, we will we will still evaluate your application and then we can say, yeah, okay, he's, he's 
will probably accept him. Uh, we only need to check if there's certain requirements that have not yet been met, but may have been met after the, uh, the, the final semester. Or if just the final degree is missing and we already know all the courses you took, then we might say, ah, oh, well, yes, okay, content-wise, that's okay. So the bachelor pro your bachelor is comparable to our bachelor and then we can allow you in. But we still need to wait for the grade because apart from the content, and I'll talk about that in, um, in a couple of minutes, uh, apart from the content, there's also the question uh, that needs to fit somehow. As I said, your bachelor degree must be somewhat comparable to our bachelor degree. Otherwise, you won't have a chance in completing your, your master here with us. And uh, on the other hand, there's also uh, other requirements. And one um, among those requirements is also um, the, uh, the grade that you have. And depending on the grade, you might have to submit additional documents. And it's very important that if you're on the, on, on the, on the brink of uh, needing those documents, then it's good to know that you need those documents because you need to send them in by 31st of May as well. In general, there might be some exceptions again, but you would have to talk to UniAssist to find out what exactly the, the exact deadlines are. We don't know them ourselves uh, until when they uh, um, accept what. So uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, 100 uh, plus, indeed, yes, 150 applications. On what basis will the candidates be selected? Purely on qualification, uh, and part of the qualification is uh, the grades. So um, the better your grade, the better your chances are. We'll talk about det in detail about the, uh, about the grades and how to convert the grades and everything, uh, uh, all of those things in a moment. And um, apart from that, we check the content of your studies. That's the most important thing, in fact. So uh, that, both are important. For the grades, there's certain rules, and those rules are unfortunately very, very strict. So we don't have any any leeway there. Um, so yeah, the grade needs to be better than 3.0 on the German scale, and it needs to be better than uh, 1.6 in order to so that means 1.5 or less, because on the German scale, one is the best grade. The lower the, gra the, lower the number, the better the grade, <laughs> unfortunately, but that's the way it is. Uh, so if uh, th that value is uh, one, uh, 1 1.6 or higher, then you need additional documents like a GRE certificate, for example. But we'll talk about those things in detail uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, um, so... Apart from those strict criteria, then there's also uh, the other part, which is uh, the content-wise uh, stuff. And uh, content-wise means uh, that um, we, uh, we, we check, you, you need certain amounts of credit points in your program of, uh, in different areas of computer science, theoretical computer science, software engineering, technical computer science, and mathematical background. And that's what that's the most important thing. But we'll talk about that in a moment. We'll come back to that question, and I'll talk about all, all those things in detail. Uh, I just see here that Eric has um, a, a different uh, an, another uh, point here. Different module registration not possible. Yes, that that might be one of the reasons why you want to uh, deregister from a module. Please contact the examination office, talk to them directly, and tell them which modules. Or send them an email. You don't have to go there. You can send them an email and tell them those are the modules I would like to deregister, and then they will tell you if that is possible or if for some reason it's not possible. Uh, that should be. Uh, that uh, would be my suggestion in this case. So they can do that. Uh, and he's also got a helpful uh, tip here. Yes, uh, you can uh, use uh, a calculator. And in fact, the calculator is linked below this video. Uh, I have, uh, we, there's lots of links below this video. And one of those uh, goes to a, a great calculator. Um, the, from uh, it's at TUM, T Technical University Munich. They they host a small CGPA calculator, and um, you can you can you can check that there. I'll talk about this uh, also in a, in a moment. Uh, all right. <clears throat> yeah, we talked. Ah, uh, oh, no, sorry, we didn't talk about that. Uh, what is uh, that I have to know about the university before starting the study in, in the master's program? Also, can you please please let me know what is the selection criteria? Um, yeah, yeah. Selection criteria. We'll talk about the, the selection criteria in a moment. Uh, as I already said, with checking whether you're the basic, basic, basically, there's um, three things I think, uh, or four, three, three or four things. Uh, first is um, 
is your bachelor comparable to our, our bachelor in computer science? So general guideline, uh, first, uh, first, first general guideline is um, what, which subject is your, is your bachelor degree in? If it is a bachelor degree in computer science, your chances are not too bad, obviously. If your bachelor degree is in computer science and engineering, which is a program which is taught in many countries around the world, your chances are, again, pretty good. If you uh, have a bachelor degree in information technology, maybe, maybe not, because information technology programs are very different across the world. Uh, we've, I've seen, like, more than 5,000 uh, applications over the co last couple of years. So I guess I can can say a little bit of those things. Um, th no, sorry, not th close to 4,000 uh, applications. Sorry, no, not not exact, not to exaggerate here, uh, but still, it, it's quite. I've seen quite a lot of applications now, and uh, those programs are uh, are varying very much. So information technology in one country or even in one university might be very different from another university or another country. So it's very hard to tell. Um, if you have a bachelor degree in software engineering, for example, your chances are pretty slim because often in software engineering programs, the theoretical computer science is missing and often also the technical computer science side is missing. This is uh, something which often um, uh, leads to software engineering students, bachelors of software engineering, not being uh, accepted into our master program because, as I said, those areas are missing in, in those programs. Again, there's lots of variation around the world. Your software engineering program might have been different. And that's why we don't don't just look at the title of your program and say, ah, he studied or she has studied software engineering, so she's uh, he or she is good to go. Uh, we're really looking exactly into your transcript of records. We're looking at all the courses you took. We can't look at the details of the courses, of course, but we're assuming that if you had a course like calculus or linear algebra, in your, uh, or even if it's just higher mathematics, or mathematics for engineers or some engineering mathematics or something like that, then we are assuming that this would be kind of like the mathematics stuff that our students learn here uh, 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 too. So we assume that this is comparable. You might still run into problems later because it turns out it's kind of like a, li a little bit is, uh, the, of the risk is on your side because it might be that we think you are, um, you, 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 you have, you fulfill all the requirements, that you meet the requirements, that you, your mathematics skills are very good, because from the paperwork it looks like you did lots of mathematics. In fact, many of the students, uh, of, of the applications we get from other countries, uh, the students have, have done much more mathematics than our own students have. Uh, but unfortunately, that's no guarantee. Uh, because it might be that you just barely passed and r really don't remember much from the courses, to be honest. Uh, this is sometimes the case, of course. Uh, and also, um, it might well be that um, we still ha have taught different things. And that's kind of like the risk you take when you come to, uh, to our university, or generally in general, to another university, that things might be different there, and that you might have to learn things extra because we thought you might bring those things along and you discover in the lectures, oh, well, there's cer certain deficits I have, and then you'll need to work on those deficits yourself. So that's nothing we will help you with, but you'll, you'll have to do that yourself. But as I said, we'll talk about the details uh, later on. Uh, oh, right, I was, I was talking about the, the different programs. And what I can virtually guarantee is that if you have uh, studied like uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, if you have studied petrol engineering, if you have studied anything uh, business computing or something like that, you're almost guaranteed to not be accepted into our program. Uh, there's other programs available for people who have a bachelor in those degrees, but usually we have virtually zero acceptance for grades for people who, with a bachelor degree in that, uh, in, with those kinds of uh, bachelor degrees unless they have some additional academic programs. And that's also very important. We, only count, uh, we can only count academic um, endeavors. So whatever you did on, on the job, even if you have, uh, say, for example, you, you studied, say, electrical engineering, and then you worked like 10 years as a, as a software engineer somewhere, we still would not count that as software engineering 
towards that field because we need we only can check what you've done in university we only can check what you've done with it and not just in university but even in regular bachelor programs in university so even if you took Coursera courses of something from Harvard uh, online courses from Harvard or something like that if they were not part of your original bachelor program or master program some of you already have a master master's degree I don't know why you would want a bachelor a master degree from Germany then as well but maybe you do um, and, but in, the, in those cases, things might be different, but only from those uh, regular academic programs is what we can accept uh, for, in, for uh, with the applications. Um, and that also, uh, guess, I guess, answers uh, this question. Uh, is it an added advantage for a person with more practical exposure? No, none at all. Uh, we really don't, um, don't look at, at it at all. So uh, you might want to add those documents uh, for complete, the sake of completeness, uh, but we, we don't uh, look at practical experience uh, where people have worked for, for a number of years or something like that. Because university is quite a different beast, and that's why we are not looking at those things. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, just coming back to the other question, sorry if I'm skipping a little bit back and forth, but I don't want to have Eric sitting around here uh, listening to all the, uh, the other things he might not be interested in because he was the first to start with the question. Uh, and that's why I would like to uh, answer this question as well, just in between. Hope that doesn't... Uh, distract us too much from the other topic. We'll come back to the other topic of uh, registering uh, for, um, oh, sorry, of uh, requirements and the application process and everything. Uh, your subject bucket shows full. Yes, that means that you, 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 you should, um, um, uh, that you, uh, uh, that, uh, that you, you, you might want to deregister from something. Uh, the lecturer denied you from retaking the same course. No, they can't. You can, if you have not passed the course, you can retake it. And if the lecturer doesn't believe you, send, tell them to contact me, and I'll tell them I'll tell them that they have to re, that you they have to allow you to retake the course. There's no way they can't deny you they they can deny you to to retake a course. Definitely no. Some of our lecturers might not know that because we have some new lecturers who are not yet familiar with our rules, but I'll I'll set everything straight. So. Uh, just tell them, uh, tell them I told you, and if they don't believe you, then they shall contact me. They know me, <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell, you, uh, tell them that they definitely have to allow you to, to retake the course. If you have taken a course, uh, you can retake it. If, uh, uh, yeah, it's perfectly, perfectly fine. All right, just to make that clear. Uh, sometimes our, our lecturers don't know all of the regulations, but that's what they have me for. That's all I'm, so I'm always slapping on the, them on their fingers if they are doing something not according to the rules, which is sometimes uh, not easy, but I'll do, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yes, yes, of course, yes. You can download the module handbook for the bachelor's program, but there's a little difficulty there because the bachelor program, uh, the module handbook for the bachelor program that we publish on our website, unfortunately, is only in German, so that might be a little bit, a little hard. Uh, so you still need to translate it somehow. Um, and you don't have to check really in detail for all the module descriptions, um, but I'll, I'll give some some hints on, on what is comparable, what is not comparable uh, in a moment. Um, yeah. All right. Um, another criteria for selection is sometimes work experience for a different uni. Uh, yeah, well, no, not, re not, re not really. Um, so um, work experience, even if it uh, has, has been done for, for a university, it uh, not, not, doesn't play any role. So we're really looking just at the transcript uh, of, of your bachelor program. Uh, and the selection criteria aren't, aren't really changing. We are, uh, there's minor, minor difference, uh, differences between uh, different semesters, uh, but in general we're pretty consistent over, over the last couple of years. Some regulations have been tightened a little bit because we had, um, uh, the, the point is we, uh, we, only, we, we don't have a fixed number of applications that we accept, but we really accept by qualification. 
And that means that we have, if in a year we have very many people uh, who meet the requirements, uh, then we also allow all of them into our program, and that might lead to an overcrowding of our program because we have no fixed number where we stop, simply stop or something like that. So even if you apply late, you have the same good chance, the same chances as someone who has applied early. So we don't have an, a certain deadline when after which a certain amount of people after which we close the application process. Uh, but that, some t uh, that has meant in the past, because we had one year, it's many years back already, it was in 2018, when within one year we had 200 new students in the bachelor program from international programs alone, not counting our own students who transitioned from the bachelor into the master program, or from other German universities, or from other European universities, in fact. But from 200 people from universities outside of the European Union in, in within one year. And that was a very uh, large load and that had, has caused some problems here with the teaching uh, capacities and everything. And um, that's why we, um, uh, that, uh, after that time, we, we needed to tighten the screws a little bit. So uh, some of the regulations have been uh, tightened or have been uh, more strict since then. But um, since then, uh, there have been only very minor modifications. So in general, we are pretty consistent with our uh, application process. And in fact, we're right now, because in the last semesters, we had very few students coming to us because we tight over-tightened the screw a little bit, so to speak, uh, which is why we are now loosening up a again a little bit. So uh, this semester it might be even a little easier to get into the program than it was last semester. Just a little, so very, very tiny little. So it's really just minor modifications. There's not much, not much changing. So most people we uh, rejected the applications of uh, in the last semester would uh, also get a rejection in this semester. So if you were rejected last semester, there's probably uh, not much hope in trying again with the same qualification unless you have some additional qualification in in the meantime. Okay. Um, what are the research opportunities, cutting-edge technologies in, uh, such as AI and machine learning? I would say pretty good uh, because, uh, in fact, uh, AI and machine learning in particular, deep learning stuff, are uh, one of the uh, of our ma major research areas here at uh, Paderborn University. This is, gen in general, something I would suggest uh, doing. Um, browse through the websites. Our website is catastrophe right now, uh, but uh, I hope you can still find some, some good information there. So go to cs.uni-paderborn.de. link should be below this video as well. Uh, and then you'll, uh, you can browse a little bit around. And um, if you go onto the, uh, this, uh, you always have to use the menu currently. It's, uh, it's really horrible to navigate this, uh, our, our websites at the moment. Uh, I hope we will improve that soon. Right now, we, we are hiding all the good information somewhere where you can't find it. So, um, but you, you, there's on the on the uh, in the right hand corner at the top, there is um, uh, this burger icon, the menu, where you can click on, and uh, then you'll find research. And then you, if you click on that, then you'll find uh, professors and their research areas. And then you can get a good overview of what professors we have and what their research areas are, what their interests are. And you can also go. That's the other way. Uh, the module handbook has already been suggested by Eric a couple of minutes ago. Uh, in this link below, as I said, this this the link to the Studienbüro, the, the, the study service website, and on that website you'll find the module handbook for the master program. It is available in English on, on our website, so switch to, to the English version of the website and then you'll find the um, module handbook in English and then you'll find all the courses that we are offering in our master program and you'll find that there are uh, quite a lot of uh, machine learning uh, and AI courses there and the lecturers who do those courses those are also the lecturers because in Germany it's a very close relation between teaching and research so those people are also doing research in those areas and um, so there's very good chances uh, that you can get into research program, uh, research projects uh, and work with them because we have some special opportunities in our study program. One is called a project group um, where you work over one year with a, select, uh, with a few people, uh, a few other students uh, under the supervision of a lecturer. Uh, and that lecturer usually will have that field as a research area, and then we have machine learning and artificial intelligence project groups, for example. And then often there's uh, research projects attached to those research groups, or sometimes even to the project groups, and you might then transition into one of those projects and even get a job there, even while still studying. That's quite normal that 
uh, you can get a job at the university while uh, uh, while you are still studying in the master program. Uh, you can get um, that, that can be um, allowed. Uh, that's uh, that's normal. So the the um, the authorities, the, the state authorities, allow you to to work here in Germany, of course. And uh, you can. Uh, that's one of the best ideas, I think. Uh, if you can find a job at the university, like for example within a research project, then that's always a very good idea because then it's usually much easier for you also to find an interesting master's thesis because you already know the people and your research, your your master's thesis might be collect, um, uh, somewhat con um, connected to the. Um, uh, to the to the project you are already doing or to the uh, to the work you are uh, doing there um, you felt that the curriculum is very flexible compared to most other universities where it was more concentrated yes yes definitely that's I think that's uh, you're uh, uh, spot on with this observation uh, and I w w would have commented on that anyways uh, later when I talk about the uh, what the program our program looks like. Uh, because that's really the case, and I think that's a pretty unique approach we have here at Paderborn University, and in fact we have uh, that we have in our computer science department here, um, even in neighboring departments like electrical engineering or uh, in the computer engineering uh, program, which is also a program we have. So, if you, for example, if you, um, th uh, if you uh, are not sure if the amount of theoretical computer science. As I said, we'll talk about those uh, requirements uh, more specifically in a moment. Uh, but if you feel that uh, your qualifications are not as good as they might be in, in theoretical computer science, but you are co pretty well well versed in electrical engineering stuff, for example, then you might also consider applying for computer engineering. It's a different program, and um, I, I think I don't have the links down here, but just look for for example, on the DAAD website, which is also linked below this video, I should say that the um, information on the DAAD website is not uh, yet updated, so it will be updated by the end of May uh, only. So um, you're getting more uh, uh, up, more uh, current information, more more yeah more more uh, up. Uh, up-to-date information here from, from in this video right now, then you'll get on the DAAD website, for example, but you can still check there. The general guideline is, um, and as I said, there's not so much changing uh, within the master program. Uh, so you can check on the DAAD website as well to see what the computer engineering program looks like. And then you'll see that you, you don't need the theoretical computer science, but instead you need electrical, ex uh, electrical engineering background, not just computer engineering, but electrical engineering background. Uh, that's what they will check for, uh, and even that program is uh, has some is more more regulated than ours. We have a very very flexible program, and I, I always like to uh, put it that way that um, the the master program in computer science here at Paderborn University is uh, is your master program. So you you decide what you want to do in the program. There's very very few restrictions there. There have been in the past. There have been very few restrictions, and we are even loosening those restrictions more. So you'll you in the in the future you will even be more free to do whatever you want here, uh, because we believe that all our courses are on a on a on a, on a very very good level, which means that in Whatever you do, you certain and and if you pass those courses, of course, um, whatever you uh, choose to to do, you will definitely uh, have earned your master by uh, ma your master's degree uh, through that. And we don't need to put you into certain uh, areas where we say, well, you, everyone ha has to know something about machine learning, and everybody has to know something about software engineering, and something about um, uh, artificial. Uh, Artificial intelligence. I already mentioned. I think uh, about uh, data science, for example. Uh, but uh, our approach is rather that we say, um, no, you decide what you uh, what you think you are ma what you believe what you think what you believe what uh, um, your master's degree should look like. And if you say, well, I'm all in on, for example, machine learning, then do it. You're free to do that. There's very there's just one minor regulation, and apart from that, you can do all of your stuff in machine learning and artificial intelligence, for example. Or if you say, well, no, I don't want to do that. I'd rather be an expert in uh, software engineering or in IT security. Then you can go all in on, for example, IT security, do all your stuff there, and then you're a specialist in IT security. And we'll also um, certify that on your final degree. 
given certain conditions uh, that you have really have spe specialized in that field, but then will also write, you'll not just receive Master of Computer Science, but it will be a Master of Computer Science with a specialization in IT security or artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, yeah, uh, artificial intelligence or whatever um, in, in one of those areas. Uh, we call it a little different than artificial intelligence, but anyways, you get the gist. Um, but you, uh, the other way you, uh, thing you can also do, which is a totally opposite, uh, kind of different approach to, to your master program, is that you say, well, nah, I don't really want to specialize in, in one area particularly. I'm rather the, the kind of a person who likes to have an overall knowledge. I'd like to know a little bit of everything. So I'm not the, the specialist in one certain area, but I am the person who is will later be available to make the connections between the different areas because I know something about data science, I know something about uh, IT security, I know something about software engineering. And then you can also do that. So you just uh, take a broad approach and take a certain uh, couple, of mod, uh, couple of courses in this field, a couple of courses in this field. So like, for example, two courses in software engineering, two in uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, two in data science, two in IC, IT security, and one more you still need. Uh, so that's also something you can do. You still have to decide where, you're, where to write your master's thesis, of course, but um, yeah, well, you don't want to write multiple master's theses, I, I assume at least, that one is enough for you. Uh, so, but yes, this is indeed a very um, unique approach that we have at Paderborn University in the computer science department. So basically, you, you define for yourself what you think is a good master program. And uh, the, the thing we guarantee is that uh, we will offer you interesting courses, we'll offer you plenty of interesting courses. I won't go into the details of the course curriculum or not, not list all of the courses that we are offering. Uh, we can talk about that another time. If you're interested, then tune back in in like four weeks from now or five weeks, whenever that third Thursday in May, uh, then maybe. Uh, and then we can talk about that um, in, in detail, if, if you're interested, I just haven't prepared the, the course catalog for tonight, uh, so I won't be able to show it for, to you. But as, as, as we already mentioned, uh, that the, uh, the module handbook is available through the, universe, uh, through the uh, study service website, link below, and you can click on the module handbook and then you'll see all the courses uh, that are offered and w whether they are offered in the winter or in the summer semester and so on and so forth. So you should get a pretty good idea there. All right. Now, finally, uh, I would like to uh, talk about the, um, uh, I'll, I'll skip the de upcoming deadlines. It's, uh, anyways, it's mainly people here who are not yet studying here, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about how to get into this master program if you uh, want to apply. Okay, so um, what is important to understand is um, that we perform a some feel a pretty strict uh, evaluation of uh, your application documents. Because, we, we, of course, we can't look into your heads and we can't make individual um, uh, appointments with each and every uh, applicant and talk through with them whether they are really uh, fit to, uh, to, 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 to do their masters here. So um, still, we, we like to check as good as we can. And we're doing that only by paperwork, which has its limitations, of course, uh, but that's the only thing we can do. So as I said, the regulations might sound pretty strict, but still we often have the experience that even though we allow people in, they still struggle with, with studying here. Uh, because sometimes, as I said, we think that from the paperwork, it looks everything looks fine. I mean, Brilliant grades, uh, like uh, yeah, top top grades, uh, good uh, CGPAs. Uh, they have um, taken all the courses that we expect uh, someone, uh, to, yeah, that we expect uh, co computer scientists to have had in in their bachelor program. Uh, but still, there, there might be problems. So failure is a possibility. It might be that we overestimated your uh, your abilities, but hopefully we didn't. And that's. Um, but uh, we also don't want to underestimate you. So, uh, but what we really want, are trying to do with the uh, with the selection process is that we want to give you a good chance so that we at least at least from the paperwork we believe that you will be able to 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 pass this program, to, to succeed in this program, to get your master's degree in the not-too-distant future, hopefully. 
Um, there is this link, it's below this video, so you don't have to type it from the video. Uh, link is below this video in the description and uh, just follow that link. There's the information in a very concise form uh, you'll find on, 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 on that uh, website, but we'll talk about through the most important of those, uh, these things uh, right now. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't, I wanted to click there. Too many devices around here. Okay, so what is the first and most important thing? Oh, no, I need a drink, sorry. So first thing uh, I already talked about is that we check whether the degree you had in your bachelor program regardless of any other experiences from jobs or where, wherever or from, from um, um, other uh, um, education institutions, like, as I said, Coursera courses or something like that, uh, Udemy courses or whatever, um, we just check your bachelor program and if you, or if bachelor programs, if you have studied multiple bachelors or if you already have a master program, of course, we also look into the master program. So if you, for example, have a bachelor in, say, mathematics and then uh, did a master in uh, computer science, then, of course, we look into both of those programs to, to, and add up the, the qualifications that you gathered in those two programs. And then we'll see uh, whether we can, uh, you, you meet the requirements as uh, formulated here. So as I said, the first thing is um, you need... 20 credits in software engineering. Software engineering, I guess it's pretty clear, there's usually courses like software engineering, for example, but uh, also courses like compiler construction, databases. Those are the kinds of courses that we count towards software engineering, not the programming courses themselves. Just If you just have a course programming in C++ or programming in Java or programming in whatnot, um, those programming courses we don't count in this area. But software engineering courses, compiler construction, databases, uh, all of those things, anything related to really constructing software. That's basically what software engineering is about, not the programming part. We're always expecting that everybody who has a, who has a bachelor degree in, in uh, computer science knows at least one programming language in detail and has also some experience, as at least has heard or, or tried out a couple of uh, other programming languages as well. That's something we simply expect that everybody has. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, you run into problems sooner or later, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay, 20 credits is uh, something else that might be um, might need some explanation, and uh, that is how, how is a credit defined, because credits at your university might be different from what we mean by credits, and we're also always applying a factor here. So if your bachelor program, for example, had, say, 120 credits in total, our bachelor program has 180 credits in total. So that would mean that we would multiply the number of credits that you have on, listed on your transcript of records, we would multi multiply that by 1.5. If, you have, if your bachelor program has 150 credits, ours, as I said, has 180 uh, credits, then you can easily calculate the, 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 the factor that we are weighing in there. If you can't calculate that factor, then you're probably not the best person to try and study computer science, to be honest. Uh, so you should be able to do that conversion. Um, and as I said, so the, the one thing is, Recalculating, or, yeah, adapting the number of credits uh, with this with this factor. And if you have 180 credits, of course, it, the factor is one to one. And if you have more than the, those, uh, then there would be a factor uh, less than one, of course, applied to all of your credits. So, uh, if you have 200, uh, 360 credits, for example, we would divide every, each of your credits by one half, of course. Um, so that goes both sides, but usually most other, other countries have less credits in their programs, and that's why there's a factor of uh, greater than one applied usually. Okay, so software engineering, as I already mentioned, some of the courses. Uh, then you also need 20 credits in theoretical computer science. Credit conversion goes the same as I already said. Theoretical computer science is something that might need some explanation, and I'll do that on a separate slide in a moment. I'll leave that open for, for, for the minute. Um, then there's uh, 15 credits in technical informatics. What is technical informatics? That would be something like um, digital circuits, uh, computer architecture, um, operating systems. So no, it's not just hardware. It's also, also software, but the low-level software, like operating systems, network technologies, 
Um, and there might be different levels of network technologies, obviously. So they might be on the, on the hardware side. We all know the ISO uh, layers, uh, which start at the, uh, the lower level, where we have the physical uh, realization of a, of a network. Is it a wireless network? Is it a, a, a copper wires? Is it fiber wires or whatever? It, or is it uh, optical transmission or whatever? Uh, and then we have the higher layers, of course, and all of those layers, uh, even on the on the on the higher layers, like TCP layer, for example, the uh, transport uh, control protocol or the internet protocol, the IP layer, uh, all of those things, all of those levels, uh, we would count towards um, t uh, technical informatics. IT security might also have been a course in your uh, bachelor program, and that's always a little difficult to tell, especially from the paperwork, because we. Sometimes we don't have uh, module descriptions from your universities, and uh, sometimes because just of the high number of applications, we can't look into the uh, the, the module descriptions in detail. So sometimes uh, we might make a misjudgment there that uh, we think that IT security might have been a rather technical part, which is at, at our university, for example, we have the differentiation between IT security, which is a part of technical informatics, and we have cryptography, which is rather mathematical, uh, pretty much mathematics there, where you learn about all the cryptographic algorithms and, and things like that, but are not uh, concerned with uh, with real IT security in that sense, but with a, a rather mathematical theory of, uh, of security in a way. Uh, and a cryptography course, for example, would count towards theoretical computer science. And then finally, we have uh, mathematics of computer science, and that's usually not um, in, in your programs. So that would be courses like uh, engineering mathematics, calculus, uh, linear algebra, stochastics, um, statistics and probability theory, uh, all of those things. That's all uh, everything related to mathematics. Uh, again, 15 credits that you need there. So the one thing uh, which is uh, always causes lots of uh, misunderstanding uh, is... Um, or misconceptions is uh, what is theoretical computer science. And when we talk about theoretical computer science, we really mean theory, not the theory of software engineering or something like that, but mathematical theory of computer science in a way. The normal mathematics courses are really mathematics. They're not really computer science related, like, for example, linear algebra or calculus, which is obviously no, no direct connection to computer science, only indirect, because it's a foundation for us. Um, but here we, we are really doing inform computer science stuff, which is n not part of a, of a normal mathematics bachelor program or even a mathematics master program usually. Like we're talking, for example, about Turing machines and decidability. What are undecidable languages? How can you prove that certain problems are undecidable? You should have known, uh, uh, ideally you know what a, uh, not just what a diagonalization is, but also how to perform one how to do a reduction. So if you have, you have a given problem and you're supposed to prove that this problem is undecidable, then you should know how to do that in right? reducing the problem onto another problem that is has already been proven to be undecidable, for example. You should know about the con concepts of non-determinism. So non-deterministic Turing machines, non-deterministic finite automata, beispielsweise. You should, uh, for, for example, <laughs> beispielsweise, for example, uh, non-deterministic automata. Um, you should be able to uh, to uh, should also know a little bit at least about the proofs uh, why those different concepts are in theory equivalent to each other, but still what the the uh, the, the different concepts are. So uh, you should uh, be able to uh, explain those things. Uh, then, of course, there's NP-completeness. You should know that there are NP-complete problems. You should be able to name some of the NP-complete uh, problems. But you should also be able to prove, uh, for example, that something is NP-complete. And what you usually have is the so-called master reduction, which is uh, whether you uh, prove for a, for one problem. Typically, it's the problem of sat, the saturation problem, where you have a, a given um, long Boolean expression, and you prove that that Boolean expression is in is NP-complete. NP-complete, just to remind you, if you are not aware of the fact, means that, uh, that the problem can be solved by a non-deterministic Turing machine within polyno polynomial runtime. That's basically what you need to know here. And um, how do you prove that the set, the saturation problem, the satisfiability problem, uh, so the satisfaction of a Boolean uh, um, expression can uh, is NP complete. 
That's the, mass, uh, the so-called master reduction. Then there's other questions, like for example, uh, let's, let's have we have a given problem, like for example, the problem of color, coloring a graph. You have a given graph, and then you, uh, the question is, is this, uh, can this graph be colored with three colors? The algorithm side would be, we're trying to develop an algorithm that does that. What the theoretical computer scientist in this case does is he proves that this coloring problem, coloring of graphs, is equivalent to or can be reduced to the saturation problem. And in fact, you can do it the other way around as well. So by that way, you have proven that the uh, saturation problem, the satisfiability problem, and the uh, coloring graph problems are in fact equivalent to each other's uh, runtime-wise, that is. So you can reduce one onto the other one. So if you know how to solve one, you can know how to solve the other, and they have equivalent runtime. So that's the important part uh, with respect to NP completeness, not just that you know how to solve them, but, but that they have are in the same class of runtime uh, that you need. So that's another uh, aspect uh, you should be aware of, NP completeness. Approximation algorithms. So you uh, should know about uh, those NP complete problems that they are hard to solve usually, which means that's why they're called NP complete and that NP complete problems are usually, uh, as far as we know at least, cannot be um, completed, uh, uh, co computed by a uh, non by uh, sorry by a deterministic machine in polynomial runtime which means makes them a, a hard problem and um, in many cases uh, we uh, we and and there, there might be uh, we sometimes we want the 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 real solution, so to speak, but that would be NP hard to complete, to, to compute. And in those cases, we might uh, instead say, well, we don't necessarily need the, the, the real solution, but it would be good if we have a, an approxim uh, an, a, a close approximation to a good result. Like, for example, the traveling salesperson problem, <clears throat> where you try to find a, a perfect, uh, op optimal route for, for the traveling salesperson. And um, if you can't, if, and that is an NP complete problem, so it's hard to solve in that uh, sense. And uh, instead, you might say, uh, well, no, we are good enough if we can uh, approximate the, uh, a good solution, say that, and then prove, and then again, that's the, where the theory comes into play, and be able to prove that this problem, uh, that the approximation, the, the result computed by the approximation, is at maximum, like, for example, 5% worse than an optimal solution. And for many problems, that might be good enough, because in that case, still, uh, the, uh, the calculation might be done in a fraction of the runtime, because it's no longer NP-complete, but it's rather a polynomial runtime. So that's what approximation algorithms are for. So you should not only know that there are approximation algorithms, but also to prove, for example, for a given approximation algorithm, how does it relate to an optimal solution, things like that. And finally, of course, randomized algorithms, uh, as you all know, hopefully, is uh, like uh, is uh, that uh, worst case runtime for quicksort, uh, although it's supposed to be the in, in general, it is uh, uh, one of the fastest uh, sorting algorithms available, given certain conditions. Um, then um, uh, it's, uh, the, the worst case is still n square, uh, o, o, o of n square, so uh, poly, um, uh, n, n squared runtime, so a polynomial runtime, obviously, but uh, pol polynomial uh, of second degree in the number of elements uh, that are to be sorted. Uh, and um, uh, but the, the, in the average case is n log n, uh, average runtime is n log n and not n square, which is uh, significantly, significantly faster, of course. And by uh, the question now is, uh, how, if we do a randomized quicksort, uh, what is the worst case expected time in that case? That's what the concept is, not worst case anymore, but worst case expected time, uh, because of course there's this randomization going on, and then again, it's not just about the fact that you can randomize a quicksort algorithm, but again, it, uh, the theoretical computer science are concerned with uh, proving that this, uh, proving that for example, the runtime of this randomized quicksort, the expected uh, uh, 
the, the worst case expected time runtime of this uh, quick uh, randomized quicksort algorithm is in fact n log n. So those are the things we are doing in theoretical computer science. And what is important is that we can only count courses. We are still talking about the, the credits, uh, if you remember, although I was talking a lot about theoretical computer science right now, but we're still talking about the number of credits uh, that you need in this field. So that basically means we need to identify courses in your program which cover these, and that doesn't mean that there might be a, might have been a single lecture in uh, in a in a one semester course where you talked a little bit about Turing machines, but rather the the courses that we count for these twenty credits must be uh, must have significantly portions of that. Usually, courses like algorithms and data structures um, and design and analysis of algorithms are two courses that we count towards this field. Uh, and in fact, uh, we also call um, count uh, uh, things like um, formal languages. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit on the on the verge of uh, being accepted, but uh, we usually count it uh, towards theoretical computer science in this sense. And in particular, we count uh, courses. Of course, if you have a, a th course on the, uh, theory of computation or something like that in your bachelor program, then again, that would be counted. And as I said. The number, the 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 um, uh, credits added up of those courses need to be at least twenty when after conversion to our uh, credit system. All right, that's theoretical. So leave leave that behind us. So that's the one thing um, uh, which is important. Uh, second point is that we already had that in the discussion before is the grades. So. We already talked about the uh, conversion formula, which is linked below this video at uh, TUM, uh, where you can put in, because we, we often get mails, e emails by, uh, asking us, I have a CGPA of uh, 2.94, am I uh, eligible for the master program? And the answer we can, the only answer we can give in that case is maybe, because we can't tell, because it depends all on for, uh, on, on, on three factors. Uh, the first factor is what was the maximum grade achievable, and that's what you see in the, in the, in the, in the table down here where I have given four examples of conversions. So the maximum grade at your university, was it four, was it 10, was it uh, 1,350? So there's so many different um, ways of grading uh, student performance or bachelor degrees uh, performances. Uh, around the world, we've seen we've seen virtually everything. And the second question is, what was the minimum grade for passing at your university? And as you can see in the two uh, examples, excuse me, on the left-hand side, there's a, might be those are real examples. In fact, uh, there might be uh, someone who has uh, where the university has four as the maximum degree and two as the minimum passing degree. But it might also be 2.2 as the minimum passing degree. And that's somewhere listed on your documents. Um, and uh, hope for us, uh, luckily, UniAssist does all those conversions. So I don't have to check out where, where on all of those documents I can find the, the, the correct number. Uh, so that's something UniAssist does for us. Uh, and then the third, of course, is what was your overall grade at that university. And uh, let's just take a look at the person on the left-hand side there. The, the, at that university, four would have been the maximum uh, that uh, would be achievable, and uh, that person, uh, and the minimum would have been two. And that person has a an overall degree of three, for example. Then you put that into that formula, as I said, linked down below, um, and uh, the the result is two point five. Don't worry about the comma. That's in German. We write commas instead of decimal points. Uh, so two point five is uh, the degree. Okay, and what do we learn from 2.5? First thing we learn is your bachelor degree must be below one, uh, below 3.0. So 2.5 means, okay, yes, you're eligible, but, and there is a but, uh, with one T. Um, we'll come back to that uh, in a moment, because you need additional documents in that case, but uh, with a 2.5. Uh, so with all of those four results that we have here, all of those four people would be eligible. So if, the same, if, uh, if for example, we have a grade of uh, four and the 2.2 as a minimum degree, and uh, that person had 2.94, for example, then the, the grade in the German system would be 2.767, which is worse than 2.5 in the German system. Just keep in mind that we need to turn everything upside down in uh, your 
system probably at least uh, higher higher numbers mean better grades. In Germany, it's just the other way around. The lower the number, the better the grade. So the 2.5 student on the left hand side is better than the 2.7 students here. Student here, but he will he or she would also be eligible. The same goes for the person with 10 maximum at the university, five at the at, as the minimum passing grade. And uh, with a degree of 7.67, and that would result into 2.398. I should uh, add one thing here. We always cut off, after, we don't round after the first uh, digit. So we, we, we have the first digit before the decimal point, then the decimal point, and then the only we only consider one further digit. So 2.767 would not be rounded to 2.8. But instead, we would cut off at the 6.7, which would make it a 2.7. So it's, if, in, if it's somewhere in between 2.7 and 2.8, then it's always 2.7. So we're always cutting to the better side for you. Uh, that's uh, import, uh, another minor, minor, rule of minor importance, I would say. So this uh, third person here in, in the table would have a degree of 2.3. Even if he's, even though he's very close to 2.4, we would still count him as 2.3 because we would simply cut off the, the last two digits. And then finally we have the person on the right-hand side where they have 10 at the, uh, as the maximum grade, 4 as the minimum passing grade, and that person has 9.06, and this person then has a 1.470, which would mean 1.4 as a result. And that is the best of the four students that we have here, and that is in fact the only person here who does not need some additional document. So um, that's something very important to keep in mind. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Because, as I said, 3.0 is the absolute and hard threshold. So if your degree is higher than 3.0, then you are definitely not will not be considered uh, for our master program. So it must be 3.0 or better. Then, next thing. If it is between 3... If you, if you are better than 3.0, that means a value lower than 3.0, then there's... You still... That's the general rule, which is, uh, in general, uh, what you should keep in mind. You, you, in, in general, you need some additional document and that additional document usually is a GRE, Revised General Test. GRE is the Graduate Record Examinations, which is a test you can take in many places around the world. And um, there you need to score certain points. We'll talk about those in a moment. This, in gen The general rule, if you, if you don't take anything from this talk today, uh, it is that Usually, you do need a GRE, because this is, in fact, the single most important point why people are not accepted into our master program. In the last semester, we had 300, around 350 applications, and 270 were just rejected because they did not send a GRE, but were required to send one. So... This is the single most important reason why people get rejected, not because they weren't good enough, maybe they weren't also, but we stop, we, we stop the evaluation at that point. When we see that the, the person should have had a GRE but didn't send one, then there's no way to heal that anyway. So we don't need to, to, to look into the, into, the, uh, into the qualifications in detail because we know that we can't accept the person anyway because the GRE is an absolute necessary requirement unless... And this is the important thing, unless your degree is 1.5 or less, well, higher than one, uh, better than 1.5, uh, better, better than 1.5, and that means less. So in this case, 1.470, the, uh, the student number four on the right-hand side, that would be the only person here who does not need a GRE because 1.4, as I said, we cut off after the four, 1.4 is the be uh, is a number lower than 1.5, which means you're good to go without a GRE. I've only talked about the GRE, but you, as you can see in the slide title and also below, there's in fact a new option that hasn't been available in the past. It's a brand new option and it's just started, so there's not too many test sites around the world right now, but those will increase in due time. Um, and that is uh, the so-called digital master test. It's a the, that test exists, has existed for quite a while already. 
uh, but it hasn't, hasn't been around for computer science. It has only been there for un other programs like uh, mechan mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and things like that, but not for computer science. So this is brand new now. We have a, this uh, digital master test, or short DMAT test, uh, which is also available and that you can, might also want to take. The DMAT test, uh, the, gen the, the GRE test, is kind of a general test. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, uh, just like the name says, the revised general test. So it's a test of general qualifications. And it has three categories if you take that test. You can look that up on, on their website, of course. It has three categories. And only, we are only interested in two of them. And those two are quantitative reasoning and analytical writing. Quantitative reasoning is something, something loosely to do with mathematics. And most people are able to pass that. So the 150, uh, passing means, in this case, you need 157 points in, in that part of the test. And that's what uh, usually the applications we receive and who send a GRE have, have managed to do. There are some exceptions, but in general they have. If you are below that value, if, if, if you have only scored 156, for example, you can immediately stop applying at our university for the computer science program and in fact also for the computer engineering program because they have the same uh, requirement in this regard. So. Um, we, we will immediately reject you, even if there's just one point missing. There's no leeway for us. It's a, it's a hard and strict rule, and we can't do anything about that. The second part is, the more, is, is usually the harder one, where you need 4.0 points in analytical writing. Analytical writing is something uh, to do with uh, understanding and writing texts. And that is something which is, comes, doesn't come easy to computer science students, it seems. And uh, this is why many people struggle there. And we often get a GRE uh, certificates sent in that have 168 points in quantitative reasoning and 3.5 or 3.0 or even 2.0 points in analytical writing. And unfortunately, we have to reject those as well. We're discussing whether we can loosen the, that restriction uh, there in, 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 with regards to analytical writing, not the one in quantitative reasoning, we want to stick with that, but with the analytical writing one, but that currently the regulation stands as is this described here, so it's 4.0 points in analytical writing. Again, if you have less than that, unfortunately, we will immediately reject your application and we will not even take a closer look into your formal into your your content qualification so if, whether you uh, have enough theoretical computer science and mathematics and so on and so forth okay so the alternative to this general test which as i said particularly the part of analytical writing seems to be quite hard and here now this is now something that might be of interest to, to you if you are really struggle with these kind of uh, of tasks where in a test you are supposed to read and write something uh, in a, uh, a text and analyze something if that is, uh, is something you are not too good at then the this is uh, where the digital master test might come to re to your rescue because this is now a test which is not a general test but it's a computer science specific test that means in this digital master test, you won't be asked anything about general background knowledge about uh, analyzing any texts or something like that. But instead, what you can, what you do here is, uh, what you what you need to do here is, you you, are, you will be given certain tasks from uh, from computer science that we know that or assume at least uh, all of our computer science. Not all of them, but at least a certain part of that. That means why well, we have the percentile rank of at least 50, so that at least half of our computer science would be able to solve that particular uh, question, to, to answer that particular question. So those are computer science specific. It's a, it's a multiple choice test, and it, it asks for computer science specific stuff. So you look into, uh, you, you'll get a computer science question, like for example, from IT security, basic IT security, of course, because we don't expect you to be an IT security specialist. That's what you can become here if you like to. But rather, what we think that what, uh, the, the level of IT security or databases or programming languages or anything like that, what we think that a bachelor student should be able to answer. So that's, uh, it's, it's bachelor, bachelor level knowledge that we are, uh, we are asking there, which hopefully means that someone who really doesn't know anything about computer science on a, on a bachelor level 
who will not pass this test, but someone who is quite good in computer science should be able to pass this test. As I said, the test is brand new. There might be some adjustments needed in the future, but we hope that it is a, a good test. And if, as I said, it solves the problem that many of our computer science uh, applica applicants or, stu even, uh, or also of our students aren't really too good at uh, in, the, in these reading and writing tasks. So that might be an option for you as well. There's a minor other bonus, and that is that the digital master test, at least as I know, I don't know the exact numbers, uh, but uh, as to my knowledge, uh, the digital master test is cheaper to take, so it costs less money. That might also be uh, another factor you, you might want to consider when, when choosing your test. Okay, so as I said, general rule, if you want to apply, first thing, uh, grade-wise, I mean, um, content-wise, we already talked about that, grade-wise, your degree must be better than 3.0, and you need a GRE. That's the, the baseline of the argumentation. And then there comes the caveat, and that says, the positive caveat in this case, um, if your degree is really, really good, which means converted to the German scale, better than 1.5, it means a value of 1.5 or higher than that, uh, or lower than that. Sorry, I'm confusing things myself. 1.5 or lower than that, so 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, 1.2, 1.1, 1.0. Only, only in that case, and really only in that case, you don't need a GRE or a digital master test. In all other cases, you need a GRE or digital master test. So, as I said, if Everything else, uh, if you missed any, everything else from this talk, this is the one Im most important thing. You need a GRE. Unless. We talked about the unless already, but in general, if, you, if, uh, if in doubt, send a GRE or a digital master test. That's the main, main point of this last 20 minutes, or I don't know how long I talked about this now. But it is really important because I'm always angry because I'm always getting these applications and I'm looking at them and think, think oh, you, you've, you've got a pretty good grade, like a 1.6, for example. And your program really looks like it would perfectly fit with... Uh, you, you would probably be able to do this, but you didn't send the GRE. Why didn't you? Because, because I don't know. And that's always what, uh, I, where I think, uh, well, wh wh why didn't you read the, the, our web page correctly? Maybe because you didn't find the web page because it's, everything is so hidden. But it's also on the DAD website, which is much more uh, nicer, uh, where you find all the information. Um, yeah, so please, please. And if you know anyone, if you know anyone who wants to apply here at Paderborn University for computer science or for computer engineering, spread the word. Tell them that they need the GRE. And that only under very, very specific conditions, they don't need the GRE. So please spread the word, uh, the word <laughs> to the world uh, so that everyone knows. And hopefully we won't have to reject people because they didn't send the GRE or digital master test, as I said. So um, that would be great. That's my wish for the new year, uh, new semester. Okay. Right. Then next question that we always get or, or always often get is uh, what about language? Do I need to know... Uh, uh, do I need to know German? No, you don't. Um, you don't have to know German when you start here. That has always been the case uh, that you don't need that. And for some time now, for two, three years, I think now, um, you also don't need to learn to learn German while you are here. In earlier years, in earlier years, we um, uh, we required everybody to take German language courses while they were here. We still recommend doing that because it's very important. It's in particular if you're planning on getting a job here during your studies or maybe even after you completed your master program because that's also a possibility of course and in all of those cases it usually uh, while, while of course the computer science world is an english speaking world it helps a lot because uh, you not don't only have to talk to other people who are on, on on an academic level you also have to talk to people who are maybe not so fluent in, in the English language because they have a much lesser um, level of, of education. They 
who have people working at the university who don't have uh, who haven't studied at the university like for example people working in the secretaries people working in uh, administration they usually have studied uh, too uh, but there's different different kinds of jobs at the university and also in companies of course the same uh, is true that often in companies there are people who don't speak too good german or uh, too good english or german they should be um, too good english and or uh, you might have to deal with uh, with customers for example and so that even though nobody expects you to be the, the to be perfect in German, it might still be required that they say, well, you, you should at least be able, if we're going together to a customer, for example, uh, that you should at least be able to have some, some basic conversation with them, at least to say uh, to, uh, that you know how to say uh, hello and good morning and good evening to the, and, and goodbye to the people. Uh, this is something, um, so a, a basic knowledge of German, we would still recommend doing that. But as I said, it's not required anymore. Uh, you can study here just with English and you don't have to speak a single word of German and you won't uh, starve, you can survive uh, because in town, uh, also in Paderborn, is uh, quite used to English-speaking people because we uh, had lots of uh, British troops around here until a couple of years ago. And so um, English, speaking English is uh, usually not a problem anywhere in, in the city. So you, wo you will survive, at least uh, in that respect. Okay, so... Um, what is still required is, of course, a good um, uh, level of English proficiency. And um, again, here we have, uh, because we talked about uh, having different uh, yeah, changing of regulations, this is one regulation that we uh, did change, in fact, because uh, in the past we only had uh, like six countries listed here uh, where uh, we would not require a, a formal certificate of language proficiency. And now that's, this has been broadened very much. Uh, so. If, if in your country um, English is the official language, like for example, we had students from Nigeria. Nigeria is basically all education from, from I don't know, in kindergarten, but uh, at least from first grade onwards, everything in, is done in English, including the, 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 uh, the university programs, of course. Everything is done in English, and we still require them to prove that they can speak English, which is completely nonsense, of course. So we stopped doing that, and a uh, country from, like Nigeria, for example, English is the official language, uh, one of the official languages of the country, and also the medium of instruction at the universities always is English, as far as we know, at least. Uh, it has to be proved, uh, said somewhere in the, in the documents, but that's always listed on the final transcripts, where it always says the medium of instruction, MOI, was this and that, and usually it was English then. Uh, so both conditions must be met. So English must be an official language in, in your country. That is true, for example, for India, as far as I know, but it's not true for Pakistan or Bangladesh. Um, uh, for example, um, and in addition, your medium of instruction must have been English. As I said, medium of instruction in other countries alone is not sufficient. So uh, if you are, have studied in, like for example, Bangladesh or Pakistan, where English is not an official language, uh, but English was your medium of instruction, you will still be required to send in a certificate proving your English language proficiency. And on the right-hand side, you can see here different um, uh, uh, tests that we accept. TOEFL, uh, Cambridge, uh, CAE. It's important, the, the correct test, CAE, is, uh, advanced English, that is, because Cambridge has different, um, different tests um, that they apply. Uh, British Council, IELTS. Uh, and uh, we also accept Duolingo, which is probably the easiest to get. Uh, this is uh, something we introduced over the COVID uh, pandemic because uh, during that time it was very hard to get appointments to take an, a TOEFL or Cambridge or CAE or a IELTS test. And so um, that's why we decided to uh, allow these online tests as well. Uh, so those are some of the tests. In fact, we also uh, accept Pearson Academic, I believe. Uh, so there's more updated information on our website if you can find it. No, the, you, the, the link to, to the information for international students is below this video, so you'll definitely find that website. Uh, and there you'll find the, the, uh, an updated version of this list. I should add the Pearson test here, I think. Uh, but, and, and other equivalent tests, uh, but that in, if you take another test than one of these, then there's usually an extra step uh, required, which might slow down the process, uh, your application process. So I would recommend getting, getting one of, uh, where am I, one of these tests over here. Uh, yeah, that would be my suggestion. So, um, 
what are the required documents? Um, usually, uh, we need an officially, or not just usually, always, <laughs> always, we, we need uh, just a drink, sorry. We need an officially certified document, uh, not we, as I said, send every, you send everything to Unisys. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but you, you need to send an officially certified copy of your, uh, of your school leaving certificate, uh, which shows that at, in your home country you were allowed to, to study. Um, that's the one thing we need. Uh, there are certain countries uh, where you also need a university entrance exam, and in those countries a list uh, this is a non not necessarily complete list but a list of some of those countries uh, is given here on the on this slide um, and if you are one from one of those countries or in general from a country where a university entrance exam is required to study at a university you'll have to uh, prove that as well or send send that proof as well uh, then of course we need um, information on what you have done in your bachelor program, so uh, which means uh, academic transcripts, uh, any references uh, that might be relevant, uh, and uh, like, um, yeah, what uh, additional things you have done, um, uh, although those are not so important. The most important thing is the academic transcripts, and also, of course, the final degree certificates, if you already have them, and if you don't have the final degree certificates yet, or if you ha don't have the final academic transcript yet, but it's, it's just a preliminary transcript showing only the first seven semesters, for example. As I said earlier, we will still evaluate on the basis of the documents that we receive from you, and then we'll make a preliminary decision, but we'll still have to wait until you send us a complete academic transcript and complete the, the, and the final uh, degree certificate, and only then we can ultimately decide. Until then, we can only give a preliminary evaluation. Uh, but we'll, nonetheless, we will evaluate that, and uh, once the uh, the complete documents uh, reach us, we are usually very quick. It usually takes us le definitely less than a week. Uh, in most cases, it just takes us a day or two. Often, often we do it on the same day because we just need to check is everything uh, we, we, because we know the, the we have done the evaluation before and so uh, beforehand, and so we we can we just need to check. We always make our notes, and then we know this is uh, we need to check whether there's uh, this condition. There was a, there's still two or three things left, and we need to check this condition, this condition, and this condition. And if all three are met, then we're good to go. So that usually goes very, very quickly. So usually within a day, uh, you should be uh, from just if you just just send the, the final transcripts and the final degree certificate. Then usually uh, we can do decide that very quickly. Uh, what is a little more difficult is if you are still in your sixth semester. We also have that sometimes that people are in the sixth semester and uh, ask if they can apply. Yes, you can as well, <clears throat> and we'll do the same evaluation process in that case. But quite often in the sixth semester, you don't meet the requirements that I mentioned content-wise, so with regards to theoretical computer science, software engineering, technical computer science and mathematics, and that usually means that at that point we can only reject the application. So usually, if you're only in your sixth semester, I would usually not recommend sending uh, already applying because you'll probably get a rejection which doesn't mean that we would uh, reject you if you applied half a year or, or a year later than that and I can understand why you want to do it as early as possible but if there are still too many things missing from what we require that you have done in your bachelor program then we simply can't accept your application that's the problem at this point so usually so if, if you are really keen on starting your your master here with us as soon as possible after you completed your bachelor, I would usually recommend um, applying with your seventh semester um, transcripts. Uh, and that should usually be uh, enough for us to evaluate whether, uh, as I said, at least for a preliminary result, that should usually be enough. Uh, and then uh, this, that's the other hint I can give you. Um, as I said, you can apply until 31st of May. Um, but in, I would always recommend, especially in those cases where, where you want to be, <clears throat> where you want to be notified as early as possible, it's always a good idea to apply as early as you can. So, <clears throat> in, in this case, as I said, you once you have received your seventh semester transcript, 
that would might then be the point when you immediately send uh, prepare all, all of the, your documents, send them to Uniassist. Uniassist will tell you whether any documents are missing. Unfortunately, they won't tell you when when the GRE is missing. We are working on that. That they will tell you that as well. Uh, but uh, until now, they don't do that. Uh, they uh, they simply pa uh, send the documents on to us, and we only find out that the GRE is missing, and then we reject your application. But apart from that, it's, as I said, it's a good idea to uh, apply as early as you can because, as I already said, we already have 150 um, um, applications right now, and uh, the number will increase uh, over the uh, coming weeks. Uh, and the more applications we receive, the we, we have to keep keep going, of course. And um, uh, so uh, uh, kind of uh, the applications kind of pile up and uh, very early in the application phase, we usually only receive like maybe five or yeah, maybe five, five applications in a week. And then we're very quick. Then usually the turnaround time is like a week. So UniAssist in general, UniAssist usually takes something around three weeks. It can take longer. Again, I don't know their internal processes. And when there's many applications coming, as I said, the closer to the application deadline you get, the more applications we usually get. So their, their pre-processing time might also increase uh, in um, the closer we get to the application deadline. Uh, and but usually around this time, uh, it's it's around three weeks that UniAssist takes until we receive the documents. And once we have them, right now we are at, uh, at the beginning of the application phase. We were at a, a, about two uh, uh, about a week that we uh, needed to evaluate uh, the applications. Uh, each individual application was around a week, maybe even, sometimes even less than that. Depends very much on on the, on the amount of work that we have to do and also the other. Um, uh, the other things we have to do uh, and uh, right now we are at two weeks time a little over two weeks in fact to um, like 15 days right now uh, is the current uh, uh, time we need uh, for for applications um, and uh, that time might increase over time so uh, with the closer we get to the application then it might take up to three weeks for us as well uh, so as I said the earlier you apply the the quicker you will get your results. So not just because you applied earlier, but also because the time between sending in your application and us doing the uh, doing the review of your application is also um, closer to each other's. So as I said, academic transcripts, final degree certificates, if available, and uh, if not available, then as, as soon as you have them, just send them. Uh, uh, send them as soon as you as you can, uh, and also. We need a resume and a CV or a CV, a curriculum vitae, showing a complete list of your education and training up to the time. Uh, that's also important for us. Um, you don't need any recommendation letters uh, by, by anyone, so um, you can put them in, but it's it's not required. And I'm only talking about Paderborn University and the computer science program. In other programs it might be different, and at other universities it might be different. And this is generally something I would recommend. I'm not trying to make... Uh, to advertise other other universities here, but uh, something I would always recommend is also checking out other universities and considering applying at more, to more than one university, because our we have our rules and regulations for um, for the requirements, and other universities have others, and it might well be that we, for example, say, well, that's not enough theoretical computer science in there, and another university might say, oh, well, that's good enough for us. Um, we are quite in line with many other uh, universities in Germany, but uh, as I said, every university has their own uh, criteria, their own regulations there. That's no, there's no uh, nationwide standard on, on these things, uh, so everyone can decide differently. And what I would also recommend, if you think, if you believe yourself to be not as strong in theoretical computer science, then you might also consider applying to a university of applied sciences, as they are called. They usually have less emphasis on the theoretical side of uh, computer science. Uh, of, in general, this goes for all study programs. They usually have less emphasis on on the theoretical side. That's why they're called universities of applied sciences. You should be aware, of, however, of the fact that. Um, Though the names are very similar, University and University of Applied Sciences, they are two really different kinds of universities. So uh, you 
might ch want to check a, an article in, in the Wikipedia on that uh, to understand some of the details. Uh, but still, you can make a master's degree in, in a university or in a, universities of a, a university of applied sciences. Both, both is uh, possible. To make things even more complicated, there are some universities which have uh, even different names. We are Paderborn University, for example, but uh, the Dortmund University, for example, is called TU Dortmund, Technical University Dortmund. Uh, but still, they're just a normal university, not a university of applied science. Or there is, for example, the RWTH in Aachen. Uh, RWTH means Rheinisch-Westfälische Technische Hochschule. They don't even call themselves Universität, they call themselves Hochschule, which literally translate into high school, but it's not a high school, it's a university, because Hochschule in German is something different than a high, than a high school. Hochschule really means university. The RWTH, despite the name, again, is a regular university and not a Fachhochschule or University of Applied Science. So things are a little complicated in Germany sometimes, and this is one example. All right. Okay. Last thing uh, I want to mention uh, with regards to the application is uh, that, as I already said before, please send all documents to UniAssist and only to UniAssist. You don't ever need to send any documents directly to us. You can send all your documents to UniAssist, and that also has the advantage that you can apply at several universities with UniAssist, not just with our university. So you only have to send your documents once, and then you can apply to different universities. I think there's a fee associated with every university you want to apply to, but still it makes things easier for you because you don't have to deal with different addresses. You get everything through UniAssist. Uh, you send everything to UniAssist. That makes things very easy. This is this link here where you can uh, log into, and um, then you'll need to navigate through the path, application, university of master, and then uh, you'll need to know that Germany is a federal state and federal states, just like the U.S., for example, you know that they have different states like Michigan and uh, Wyoming and uh, states like that. And uh, here in uh, Germany, we have also different states like, for example, Bavaria or Northern Westphalia. And we are in Northern Westphalia. And uh, in, within Northern Westphalia, you will then find the Paderborn University. Um, I haven't talked about the city or anything like that. Uh, if you're interested, again, we can talk about that in four weeks' time uh, when we meet here again, if you like. And then we can talk about other topics that I haven't addressed today or we can repeat things uh, that we have talked about today, depending on who is there and who asks which kinds of questions. So, um, yeah, but we won't go into that tonight because we've already been going for more than one and a half hours and I think it's... Uh, Time to wrap up uh, sometime, sometime soon, but there's still a couple of things we, uh, I would like to talk about. Um, currently, there's a small irritation there. If you uh, look at the UniAssist website, that will change in the future, but uh, currently I think you can still choose between computer science and informatic. And if you try to be clever and think ah, informatic is the German word for computer science, so apply, so I apply for that. Don't <laughs> really apply for computer science because informatic. Um, then people ex um, for for, for str some strange reason, which I won't even try to explain. Uh, when you choose informatic, then you need uh, to prove proficiency in the German language, uh, just because you picked the wrong word on that website. Don't ask me why. It, it is a long story and I don't want to talk about that because it will be history soon, very, very soon. And as I said, application deadline for the winter semester starting in October is the 31st of May. So make sure that all of your documents are there by that time. That is very important. Okay. Is there any specific deadline after the application deadline has passed to submit the final degree transcript? This is exactly the right question for what I was just talking about. Um, no, <laughs> as far I, I at least I'm not aware of that. So this is something uh, which you really wouldn't uh, need to talk to um, UniAssist to to the people at UniAssist to um, because I don't know the exact dates until when you can send which documents. So uh, I know that there are certain documents can be handed in later, like, for example, the language certificates usually, are, as far as I know at least, are not a problem. 
um, and some other documents might as well. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, we all are always, I haven't got that on my uh, slides yet, I need to, need to add that. Um, you are probably aware that at least most of you, I think, if not all of you, uh, would need an APS certificate as well, which is this kind of something that the states have decided to, uh, to uh, require, which is difficult to uh, uh, hard to come by because uh, not, not in theory, but uh, be just to get an appointment to get that thing and everything. Um, and the APS certificate is in fact also not required by the, uh, by the application deadline, uh, but uh, you can hand that, oh, I, I think that is left until you try to enter Germany or something like that. So that's a very, very long time in the future. Um, and we'll tell you about those things. If, if there is any questions regarding the APS certificate, please don't ask them now, because as I said, you can definitely hand the uh, APS certificate in much, much later, uh, and you'll get information on, on those things later on, if assuming that you have been accepted um, in that case. Uh, you will receive a formal not uh, we will we will notify you informally but you'll also get an, a formal notification from our international office and um, the international office will then be your point of contact for all questions regarding entry to germany the aps certificate how, how uh, wh where to send it when to send it and all of those things travel arrangements if you have questions regarding um, accommodation so everything that's not directly related related to the computer science program those questions should best be uh, directed to the international office. Link is below this video again, but as I said, there's not much use contacting them now uh, unless you have very specific questions. But apart from that, I would recommend waiting for the formal notification where lots of things will be explained to you for, for the further process. And then uh, they will all, uh, then you know who to contact and then you can ask them specific questions uh, on, on certain, certain things. Uh, the GRE, no. The GRE really needs to be there by the deadline, as far as I know, at least. Uh, but again, I would uh, rather recommend asking the uni assist people uh, whether they can put you on hold as well. Uh, but I guess at least when uh, the GRE must be there when they forward, forward your application to us. That's the only thing that I know. And I'm not sure if they ex accept the GRE after the application deadline or if they ex uh, uh, require that to be there by the application deadline. But that's something that the people at, at Unisys will be, will be able to tell you. All right. Um, yeah, happy to hear that uh, positive feedback. That's always great. Uh, yes, we, we, we will have future sessions, as I already said. We do this um, uh, every every four weeks. Um, so uh, not every four weeks, always on the third Thursday each month. So, but that should be four weeks from now, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, there should be um, the next uh, live stream on the batch. Uh, sorry, on the master program in English language just like we did today, and uh, we can talk about, uh, you, you're always welcome back there, of course. If you have questions in the meantime, of course, you can send us emails as well. Uh, that's also no, no problem at all. But apart from that, I think it might also be a good idea to just join in here on the, on the next live stream, and then we we'll, can talk about other stuff. And then I can talk about, for example, about the, you, the questions you already had, like uh, the um, what research areas are there, if, for example, related to AI and machine learning. And I already saw that, uh, I think it was uh, Eric who already mentioned a couple of our professors um, uh, who, are, who are doing uh, doing interesting things. Oh, that's interesting. A <laughs> person Turco is writing headphones. So, uh, um, Emojis don't work in this uh, tool uh, that I'm using here, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, but in fact, those are uh, some of uh, some of our uh, interesting researchers. But there, there's a couple a couple of uh, very good people uh, around here. So, um, yep, that's uh, yep. I think we uh, yeah. But we we can talk about those things uh, later on in 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 another uh, live stream. I think, and also about the details of what the course program looks like. As I already said, it's it's very simple, and it, uh, because you you're basically free to do what whatever you want, as long as you find enough interesting stuff in our module handbook. But we have like I don't know like six, 60 different courses available for the master program, so there should be something for everybody. 
uh, it really shouldn't be much of a problem to find an interesting course program for yourself. And as I said, you define for yourself what you want your bachelor to look like. Uh, sorry, your master, of course, to look like you, the bachelor you already have or are, are, are currently on track on uh, uh, getting your bachelor certificate. <coughs> sorry. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and I think with that, I'd like to leave it. I'll just take a final sip from, from my bottle. I guess I'll leave it at that uh, for tonight. Thank you for joining uh, me here. Um, just the final reminder, um, as I always do at the end, although I already mentioned that a couple of times before. Next live stream uh, on this channel will be on the first Thursday uh, of May, which should then be, I'll just check the date. Uh, on the second of second of May, but that will be for the bachelor program, and that will be in in German uh, in, in German the live stream um, for our bachelor students and prospective bachelor students, and then on the sixteenth of May we will have another live stream for the master program, which will just like today be in English, and uh, where we can talk about all things master program and all things you are interested. in. In, like, for example, I can talk a little bit about the city of Paderborn, for example, because maybe you want to know something about Paderborn, maybe you want to know something about Germany, maybe you want to talk about I don't know what, and I can see whether I can tell you anything about it, because there's lots of things I don't know, of course, just like anyone. Uh, but uh, yeah, and we can also talk about the course structure and uh, what uh, also about some of uh, those focus areas that we have where you can specialize in and things like that. That's something we leave for the 16th of May. So um, yeah, as I said, uh, you're welcome to join me again then in four weeks time at again Thursday evening, 16th of May, 6 p.m. Central European Summer Time. So set your clocks accordingly or just watch on the YouTube channel, uh, on, the, on the YouTube website, because they always tell you the right uh, conversion of the, of the dates and times, I think. Uh, so, and general, all, all of our live streams, uh, and in case something, something happens and I won't be able to make the live stream for some reason, um, then uh, we'll also announce that uh, we'll, we'll change the date on the, on, the, on the YouTube channel and also on the sh um, study service website. You'll also find, always find the next, uh, the, 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 the live streams for, for the next month, currently not, obviously, because there's still this month uh, live stream uh, uh, advertised there, but from uh, in a couple of days' time, you will find the, the new dates of the, of the next live streams. Okay, so um, uh, this is it for tonight. I uh, wish you a good, uh, for, for me, it's good, good night. I don't know what time it is in your places, where, wherever you may be, but for me, it's uh, time to call it a, a day. So um, uh, all the best for you. Um, if you are still working on your bachelor degree, then um, good luck with, it, with that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope that I'll get some of your applications in the near future. And as I said, don't forget to send the, the right documents. Remember the GRE. Uh, check if you need the GRE. If in doubt, as I said, you can also mail me and uh, email me. I won't take a look into your uh, into application documents. So I can't check if you if you say, well, I've done this is my bachelor transcript. Could you take a look at it and uh, and check whether I'm eligible? Sorry, I can't do that I simply, because we simply have too many applications coming in. And uh, we, we just can't, can't do that. But what I can do is if you send me the information that you, but you can do that yourself as well. If, if you just have those three, those three important information, bit, bits of information, uh, the maximum degree achievable in your program, the, the minimum degree for, um, <clears throat> for, um, for passing, and your own degree. Enter those three data into the, uh, into the, um, uh, this, this calculation tool, which I have linked uh, below this video, and I've also mentioned it on, on one of the slides before. Uh, or if in doubt, just email me, but send me those three data. Because if uh, without those three data uh, points, the, my own, the only answer I can give is maybe. And uh, this is why we need these three data. So if you do the conver conversion yourself, or if you don't do the conver conversion yourself, but you're still unsure if you need a GRE or not, just send me a quick notification and you'll get just get a quick answer from me where I just say well yes you do or no you, uh, no you're good to go and everything should be fine all right so 
All the best for you, all of you. Maybe I'll uh, see some of your applications in the future. Maybe I'll see some of you in the future if we accept your applications and you decide to accept our invitation uh, to our university because if you have multiple uh, applications, then you might also want to choose a different university, although I, personally, of course, I don't understand why you would want to choose any other university than us and, or any other program than computer science, of course, but uh, yeah, it's up to you to, to decide. All right, so uh, all the best for you and uh, have a good night or good day or whatever it may be. Stay safe, stay healthy and see you sometime soon. Bye-bye.